to go. Okay, uh, so now we're going to move on to uh, the next lecture portion of course. Um, we may not get through all the lecture before lunch. This is a long one, so we may do half of it and then take it up, take the next half after lunch uh, before the lab. Because now we're doing the fun stuff, finally. We're going to look at how we actually do a bio biological analysis and draw biologically meaningful conclusions from our data. So first we need to figure out what our question is and make sure we have the right data to answer it. Right, so we could ask questions like, what's the progenitor states that exist between two cell types? How does a gene variant affect the identity or function of different cell types? We could be interested in how many cell types exist in a particular tissue, or we might be interested in cell-cell communication or transcription factor regulatory networks, right? How does a transcription factor regulate the differentiation of a cell type? So going back to our workflow, we've done normalization, feature selection, dimensionality reduction. So now we're gonna calculate cell-cell distances, a q nearest neighbor graph, and then do our clustering or trajectory inference, depending on what we're interested in. Okay. So first we need to understand what a graph is. So this is a graph. It's got vertexes, which are in our case cells, and edges that connect them. And in the case of single cell RNA-seq, it's not obvious what an edge means, right? Um, the, these methods were designed for things like social networks, where you have like their friend or you're not, and that's your edge. For single cell, it doesn't make that much sense. So what we do to create these edges is just find the closest cells. So I've already mentioned k nearest neighbor networks used by UMAT. They're also what we use for clustering, except not really. Okay, so if we do k nearest neighbor network, so k equals three, we're just going to connect each cell here to its three closest neighbors. Okay, so if I go to that cell down there, those are its three closest neighbors. That cell over there, three closest neighbors. If I do that to the whole graph, or to all of the cells, I get a graph that looks like this. So this doesn't look too bad, but we have some problems here, right? If we look at that top cell right up here. Okay, so sort of up here-ish, up there. See that that cell is really, really far away from everything else. Having it have edges to its three neighbors, having those edges count the same as the edges say between the cell and its three neighbors, seems a bit weird, right? It's much, much farther away than the other, than some of the other cells are to its three neighbors. We can also see with this group of three cells over here, like that looks like it should be a cluster, but it's well connected to this other cell because we've got three as our K and there's only three cells in that cluster. So they're, each of those are reaching out to the next closest cell that happens to be in a different cluster. So we have these sort of outliers that get attached to various clusters and we have these small clusters that tend to get merged with larger clusters. So to try and fix this, we instead actually do shared nearest neighbor networks. So here we take each cell, we connect it to its three nearest neighbors, and then we ask, how many of those three nearest neighbors are the same as your next door friend and their three nearest neighbors, right? So this yellow guy up at the top, its three neighbors are these three cells. None of them are neighbors to each other. So all of those edges get erased. They get turned, turned into zeros. As it, it shares zero neighbors with those other cells. And we can also see that this group uh, by itself out here, its edges to this group get erased. All of the neighbors of that other cell are neighbors, are cells in its cluster, not this cluster, not the red cluster in red. Right? So that sort of cleans up our k nearest neighbor network to something that's uh, more meaningful. So once we've got that graph, we can now use a uh, clustering algorithm designed for graphs to identify clusters in our cells. And that's really the whole goal of this, right? We didn't have to create this graph. There's no real utility to it, except to allow us to use algorithms that are designed for graphs. 
which we want to do because these algorithms are super quick because they, again, were designed for Facebook data. So data where we've got millions of points and tons and tons of edges. So these are scalable up to data sets of billions of cells pretty easily. Whereas all the other clustering methods, they pretty much die and take forever once you get over a thousand cells. So I break down this equation. So the clustering method we use maximizes the modularity score to define the clusters in a graph. So here we have uh, this little uh, delta symbol there represents whether two cells are in the same cluster or not. If they are in the same cluster, then we calculate the observed number of edges between them and subtract that from the expected number of edges between them. So if that observed number of edges is high and higher than the expected number, that's good. Those cells should be in the same cluster. If the expected number of edges is higher than the observed number of edges, that's bad. Those cells shouldn't be in the same cluster. So we calculate the score, adding up the score for each pair of cells to get our overall score for how good our clusters are. So here our clusters are going to be sets of points that have a high density of edges between them, uh, higher density of edges between them than expected by chance. So if we have a graph like this and uh, green and purple are our clusters, this will get a high modularity score because there's lots of edges between the points and few between them, the between the clusters. Whereas if we cluster like them like this, we get a bad modularity score. Right? There's not very many edges with, between points of the same cluster and lots of edges between points of different clusters. So the way the algorithm actually works is, right, we've got the score that we want to maximize. So it just randomly picks a cell looks at its neighbors and asks, if I merged you with the cluster of one of your neighbors, would the modularity score go up? If the answer is yes, it merges that cell with that cluster. And if it's yes for multiple, it picks whichever has the biggest increase in modularity. So for the, if anyone had some computer science experience, uh, this is a greedy optimization task. Right? It takes the best step at each, best option at each step. And it's super scalable. Uh, so that's the scaling. I'm not going to explain that for people who aren't in computer science because it doesn't really matter to you. Just need to know it'll work for billions of cells. But it's stochastic, which means every time you run it, you could get a different answer. So if you rerun your clustering, don't su be surprised if you have different clusters the second time. Right? So once it's hit that, that cell, decides, so oh, it would be better if this was in the same cluster as it's green neighbor, so it becomes green. Then it just picks another cell, repeats the process. So this one decides grouping it with purple would be best. And it goes down here and decides grouping it with blue would be best. And that one groups with purple, then with green, then with purple, then with green, and green. And now, no matter what it does, it can't do better than it already is. So then it just stops. And this is your clustering. Right, so while I showed you this equation before, I actually lied a little bit because there's a parameter in here, and that's uh, gamma there, which is the resolution. So you'll see when you have you cluster with SURAD or another method, you'll have, have either a default resolution or you'll be setting the resolution. That's what it actually means. So it's how much higher does the observed number of edges have to be than the expected number of edges for that to be considered a good clustering essentially. So if you set a high resolution, you need lots and lots and lots of edges for it to be considered a good clustering. So you'll get small, dense clusters, and a lot of points won't get clustered very well at all. If you set a low resolution, you don't need very many edges to be considered a good cluster, so you'll get lot, much bigger clusters and fewer of them. You also have this parameter as well, which is the K you use for your k-nearest neighbor network. Uh, which is usually done as a separate step, so it's much harder to change this, uh, but it also has a big impact on your clustering. So if you have a high K with lots of neighbors, they'll get fewer, larger clusters. 
And if it's a low value, you'll have more smaller clusters because you'll have fewer edges just in total between your cells. Okay, so that's our full pipeline for how we do clustering. So you'll realize when you start doing this for real, finding a rare cell type in your data is actually really hard to do. So give a few minutes to think about where in this pipeline you might lose a rare cell type in your data set. So say you've got 5,000 cells and you've got a cell type that re that's represented by 15 of those cells. Where might you lose that information? I think everyone had a chance to think about this. Any suggestions of where we might lose these cells in this cluster? Yep. Yes, sir. I, I feel that at the feature selection, because um, feature selection when referring to your high variable gene expression, like, but if you have 5,000 cells, we probably focus on the variable gene for those 4,985 cells, then the high, high variation. But the real cell population, maybe for them, those 15 cells, the variable genes are actually very different. So if you select the, the variable gene does not apply to those 15 cells, but you end up those 15 cells actually will be just put in the shadow, you uh, very hard to find those 15 cells. Yeah. Yeah, so when you do feature selection, you're very likely to miss any gene that's a marker gene for a very small cluster. Because out of the total variability in the data set, it's explaining a very small amount. So you're very likely to not pick those genes when you do feature selection. Any other suggestions? Yeah? It's really isolated so it's cut off from all the other clusters. That makes it first. Yeah, yeah. So during the shared nearest neighbor network construction, if your K is too high, you might end up just merging that cluster with another cluster. You think that maybe in every step you can choose a population that is small, arbitrary, and unfavoring in expression? At every stage? Um, yeah, so to some degree, you can lose them at every stage. But the most of the biggest risks are the two that were mentioned for feature selection and your k nearest neighbor graph. The clustering al algorithm usually can find them if they're properly isolated. 
So if there are no edges between that cluster and any of the other cells in your data set, then your clustering algorithm will still be able to find them. But if there are some edges, then your clustering algorithm will just merge it with another cluster. And if your, your dimensionality reduction is another place you can miss them if you don't keep enough principal components. If you keep only the top, top principal components, you'll generally miss the small clusters as well. But because we can safely just add extra principal components, you tend not to lose them because people tend to be generous and just take too many principal components. Everyone's done typing out the answer there. All right. So now we're going to talk about actually understanding the output of our clustering algorithm. Because a clustering algorithm will always give you clusters. Even if there are no clusters in your data, it will still give you clusters. So you'll always get an answer for almost all of the algorithms we're going to talk about for single cell RNA-seq. That doesn't mean the answer is true. And to some degree, there's no solution for some of these problems. So when we're talking about clustering, it's actually logically proven that there is no best clustering algorithm. It's not possible to have a best clustering algorithm. So it's all down to your interpretation of the results. Okay, so here's some data. How many clusters do you think are in this data? How many people vote three? Yeah, quite a few. How many people vote four? Yeah, a few different ones. How many people vote five? Yeah, kind of equal numbers for each one. Any other numbers people want to vote for? No? Well, I, I generated this data, so I know how many clusters I created. All right, so this is my guesses for what you would think. All right, three. Four, five, very possible. This is true. So that's how I generated the data in four different distributions. So one square cluster and three round clusters. So you can see, even for people, it's hard to know how many clusters are in your data and what the right set of clusters is. So it's just as hard for algorithms to do it. All right, so how do we determine if we've got a good clustering out of our clustering algorithm? So there's lots of different scores we can use for this. Again, similar to there's no right answer for what the best clustering method is, there's not necessarily a best answer for how to determine a best cluster. So you wanna do lots of different measures and hopefully they'll all agree on the same set of clusters. All right, so the first one is you could look at the robustness of the clustering, right? So you could change your resolution, can change your K, you still get the same clusters, that's probably a good set of clusters. You could look at the number of differentially expressed genes or marker genes between your different clusters. If every cluster has a large number of marker genes that are very clearly unique to that cluster, those are pretty good clusters. You could look at known marker genes. So maybe you know you have a marker for T cells, you can see which clusters express that marker, and if it's nice and concentrated in one or two clusters, then you've got some good clusters. If you've got a bunch of clusters where half of the cells are expressing that T cell marker, probably not good clusters. You can look at quality statistics. There's dozens of these. I'm not gonna go through all of them. The most popular one in single cell analysis is the silhouette index, which I'll explain in a little bit. You could also look at the consistency across experimental replicates. So if you've got a data set where you've done 10 different replicates, you could cluster each one of them separately and see if you get the same set of clusters as if you clustered them all together after integrating the data together. You could also look if you have ex uh, other data related to those same samples. So you could look at spatial transcriptomics data that matches your single cell, or you can do various experimental validations, right? You can flow sort out those cells and do qPCR to confirm they're real or do functional analyses to confirm that they are functionally different from each other. But you'll note 
out of all of these, seeing that they look good on a UMAT or TSNI is not on the list. The reason for that is because all of these clustering algorithms are packaged with a visualization method. Both of those, that visualization method and that clustering method, use the same set of assumptions and the same set of data to generate their output, so they will always agree with each other, even if they're both wrong. All right. So the silhouette index. So here's two clusters. When we calculate the silhouette index for each point, for each cell, in this case, I, we define the cluster it's in and the next closest cluster to that cluster. So let's guess the blue cluster. If we had other clusters, though, they would be further apart from yellow than blue is. So first we calculate the distance from that cell to all the other cells in the same cluster as it. Then we calculate the distance from that cell to all the cells in the next closest cluster. And we take, just take the difference of that. So if the distance to cells in the neighboring cluster is bigger than the distance to cells of the same cluster, that's a good thing. That's a good cluster. If it's the opposite, if it's more, uh, closer to cells of a different cluster than its own cluster, then it's a bad cluster. That's how we define the silhouette index. We can generate various plots to show this. So here's a bunch of clusters and the silhouette index for each cell in each, each of those clusters. And you can see for all of them, they're all positive and they're pretty high values. So all of these are good clusters. If we were to increase the resolution and one of the clusters gets split in half, now you can see for those two clusters, still index has dropped down a lot and we're starting to get negative values. So now we can know that orange and turquoise in this case are probably not good clusters and maybe we should merge them together. Or if we're manually annotating, maybe we just want to annotate these as the same cell type. And there might be lots of correct resolutions, right? You might have a data set where five clusters makes perfect sense. That's your T cells, your epithelial cells, your endothelial cells, your tumor cells, and your macrophages. But also a higher resolution with 20 clusters also makes sense because that's differentiating your CD8 T cells from your CD4 T cells from your T regs. Right? Both of those clusterings are perfectly valid. So here's a data set where clustered at two different resolutions, one where there was 18 different cell types, another where there was 42. In the orig original paper, they actually clustered at even higher resolution and said there was 48 different cell types. And then the last bit before lunch is uh, trajectory analysis, because lots of people asked about that yesterday. This wasn't originally in the slides. Um, so for all the people who asked, trajectory analysis, and I have to uh, quote um, Davis McCarthy, one of the creators of EDGAR, who when he was working on this, decided that actually when we're talking about trajectory analysis, all we're asking is, can you beat PCA in terms of your trajectory analysis method? So here's monocle, because someone mentioned monocle in the Slack channel yesterday. So here you can see the data in PCA space and what happens when you run monocle on that data. So this data is from a malaria parasite that has a cyclical life cycle in the human blood. So you can see the nice circle in PCA for all the different stages of this life cycle. And you can see what monocle did to it. So monocle makes a very strong assumption that your data is tree-shaped. So it will make your data tree-shaped, no matter what. So this data was a circle, now it's a tree, because monocle says your data is a tree. If your data is a tree, sure, monocle will find that tree really well. But if it's not a tree, it's now a tree. And this is kind of the same for all of the class, the trajectory methods. So this is a review from a review of 45 different trajectory inference methods. I should point out, none of those trajectory methods could identify the direction of cells moving on those trajectories. 
but they all made different assumptions of what the uh, what the structure of your data was. If the data matched that structure, it performed well. If the data didn't match that structure, it performed poorly. Yeah. Can you just give an overview with the what is the trajectory inference problem? No, not sure this is oh, yeah. So the trajectory inference problem is we have a gradient in our cells. So maybe we have a differentiation trajectory from a progenitor to a mature cell. And we want to fit sort of a gradient to the data. So a line or a tree if it's differentiated into two different differentiated cell types. Uh, so they're also often called pseudo time methods. I don't call them pseudo time methods because there's nothing to do with time in these algorithms. All they're finding is I want to find a smooth continuum through my cells. Yeah. A lot. So you want at least a thousand cells usually to run one of these reliably. Data points, yeah. Oh, time points? You don't need any time points but you need to have cells covering multiple different states. So if your cells differentiate very heterogeneously, you can do one time point and have cells at different time points in developmental time. And then you can still align them. But it depends on your system. If that's not the case, you should do probably at least three time points, and then you'll have a fairly good coverage and you should see a trajectory in theory. So, in that sense, if we let's say we study the development of right embryo, right, we um, so we can have one step on, then we have the cells like either this one, this two, this three. But if you choose another time point, then you will spawn a later phase, and you say on the phase three, the cell number will increase, so the cells in the phase one will decrease. Would it be then also a kind of like a validation for your trajectory to the people using them? Yeah, so it's very common to validate your developmental trajectory by looking at multiple time points and where they're located along that trajectory. Right? If you have three different time points, hopefully the average of your third time point is later in your trajectory than your first time point. Uh, but depending on the data set and actually the method used, you might get a quite big smear at each time point. Uh, that's very common to see. Yeah, so this is just a comparison of some of them. And there's not really a global winner. Um, they suggested slingshot as the overall best method, um, but PCA was a close second or third. And then people asked about RNA velocity. So the way RNA velocity works is completely different. It's not actually looking at a smooth trajectory really uh, at all in theory. It's looking at individual cells and looking at the ratio of the spliced versus unspliced reads. Assuming that reads that come from spliced, tra spliced transcripts are from mature mRNAs, Reads that contain introns are coming from unspliced transcript transcripts, so they're earlier. So they're what's coming in the future. And then if you look at the ratio of those, if you have high spliced transcripts and low unspliced transcripts, you can conclude the gene is going down in expression because the future is a lower number of reads than the present. If the reverse, so if you have more unspliced reads than spliced reads, then the expression is going up because you have more in the future than in the present. Of course, because the length of introns and exons varies gene to gene, you have to fit the null expectation of no change for each gene separately. And then you can see whether it's up or down relative to that null expectation. I titled this slide why RNA velocity shouldn't work though, because you have to make a ton, a ton of assumptions for this to be true. The big one is that the degradation rate of every spliced transcript is the same. Because if the degradation rate changes, you'll get the exact same pattern in terms of spliced versus unspliced 
transcripts, but the interpretation will actually be the opposite. So if the degradation rate is changing rather than the transcriptional rate, RNA velocity is actually backwards. So we're assuming that regulation is happening at the transcriptional level, not the degradation level. You can also get uh, reads that look like they're coming from introns from other things, right? You could have a long known coding or RNA or an antisense gene that will, that's located in an intron that will give you intronic reads that actually aren't intronic reads. Right? They're not coming from an unspliced transcript, they're coming from a different transcript that's located in that intron. There's lots of reasons why RNA velocity shouldn't work. However, using it, it seems to work most of the time. So use at your own risk. Uh, and I believe it's now lunchtime. I'll pick this up after lunch. Okay, now there's a little recording. I Most people are back. So we will pick up where we left off, where we had done our clustering. Uh, we tried out some trajectory analysis. And now we actually want to understand what our clusters represent, uh, which is known as annotation. There we go. Um, so this was work done with, or based on a paper written by myself and Delaram and one of the students in uh, Gary Bader's lab called Zoe, um, where we looked at all the different ways of annotating your cells and broke them down to sort of two main categories where you can do automatic annotation, where I use an algorithm to annotate your cells automatically. There's two basic versions of this, one where you have a reference single cell RNA-seq data set that you're comparing your cells to. And if your cell looks similar to a T cell in that data set, your cell is now a T cell. The other option is to use automatic annotation based on marker genes. They say, mm -hmm. oh, CD8, CD3, TRAC, they're my marker genes for a CD8 T cell. Based on those, what cells in my data set are CD8 T cells? Right? Both of those absolutely rely on what information you give it. So if you give a use a automatic annotation tool with a reference from liver and apply that to a data set from colon, you'll get hepatocytes in your colon. 
right? So you got to make sure you're using the right reference for your data. And all of these automatic annotation tools, while they're pretty good these days at general cell types, they're mostly terrible at subtypes. So they can definitely tell the difference between a macrophage and a T cell or T cell and epithelial cell. Telling the difference between a T reg and a T helper, not so good. Or between a inhibitory macrophage and an activating macrophage, not so reliable. So it was brought up on the Slack channel about Singular. So Singular is actually nothing particularly special. Um, it became super famous and well used because they were the first people to pull together a whole bunch of reference data sets to cover most of the cell types in the human body and have that provided as part of their tool. The actual method they use is not sophisticated at all. You just identify variable genes in your cell types, find, take your new single cell RNA-seq data sets and do the correlation of each individual cell to all of your reference clusters and whatever it's close, most similar to, that's the label it gets. But because they have lots of references that are already set up and designed to work with their algorithm, it's very easy to use. You can just download their software, download their database, done. So I talked a little bit about using references and how you need to make sure you have the right reference for your data set. Uh, which is still a problem for Singular, even though they've got quite a few references available. If you're looking at a particularly unusual tissue type, Singular is not going to be helpful for you unless you find your own reference data set. But even once you've done your automatic annotation, you're probably going to be using marker genes to try and pick apart precise subtypes and validate those automatic annotations because you should never trust them because almost all of those automatic annotation algorithms will never tell you, I don't know what the cell type is. They will give it your its best guess. So you'll get an answer. It might not be the right answer, though. So when you're using marker genes, um, you want to consider whether the genes you're using are actually reliable, reliably captured in your sequencing data, and whether they're highly expressed or not. You also want to make sure they're actually specific to that cell type. A lot of marker genes in the literature are not very cell type specific. So here I've got two genes that are both reported widely in the literature as marker genes for neutrophils. As you can see, one of these is much better as a neutrophil marker than the other. The other one's just a general myeloid cell marker. But lots and lots of papers will tell you, no, that's a marker of neutrophils. So I make sure if you're using a marker chain, is it really only expressed in that cell type? And is it really differentially expressed in that cell type? Maybe it's only like 0.5% higher in that cell type of interest compared to another cell type. And then that's not really a useful marker gene anymore. And especially when you're looking at marker genes, you want to make sure you're using multiple markers. Single cell RNA-seq data is noisy. Lots of Genes that are really great markers for flow cytometry are not well expressed or well detected in single cell RNA seq. So, you're going to want to make sure you've got a panel of marker genes for each of your cell types. So, what if you have multiple samples? So, you have two options for how to annotate multiple samples. Most people will integrate those samples together into a merge map and then jointly analyze them doing clustering, dimensionality reduction, all that stuff, and annotation. But you can also take each sample separately and annotate each one and then compare between them. Uh, that'll be a lot more work, but it will, it's still a completely valid way of doing it. Uh, and it's actually very recommended if you have difficulty integrating your data sets, try just annotating each one separately and see if you still have the same cell types actually between those samples. Uh, and then you can validate your integration method is actually working properly using your annotations from each sample. Right. Any other questions about annotation? Nope. Okay, so we'll move on to differential expression. 
So we've got our clusters, we've annotated what cell types they are. Now we want to find differentially expressed genes, either between our clusters or between our between different biological conditions in each of our clusters. So first we'll be finding marker genes. So this is different genes that are expressed differently between different clusters. So is a gene unique to cluster zero? What genes that are different between cluster zero and cluster one? To understand why we do it the way we do it, we have to really think about what we care about when we're asking this question. So do we care about being really sensitive and finding every single gene that is differentially expressed between these clusters? Or are we more interested in specificity and finding only the genes that are differentially expressed between our clusters and not getting any genes that aren't actually differentially expressed? Also, do we care about significance? Do we care if a gene is statistically significantly more differentially expressed, or we just care that it's one of the top, has the biggest fold change between this cluster and another cluster? Right, so yeah, or, or do we just care about the effect size? Is the expression very different, or do we care about it being statistically significant? If what you're doing is trying to annotate your clusters, typically you don't really care about sensitivity, you don't really care about significance, you care about effect size. Because you're only going to be looking at the top like 20 or so marker genes anyway to annotate that cluster. But if you're trying to say that oh, I've discovered a new cell type, and these are the genes that define that cell type, maybe then you care about the significance of those genes, and we want, to, and you care about the sensitivity. Right? You know, I find you'll want to use different methods depending on what you care about. And then also, of course, runtime as well. Are you willing to wait a whole day to get your marker genes, or do you want them in five minutes? So that you can go look, start looking them up in the literature to start annotating your clusters. So if you want to get accurate p-values to say that yes, this is a new cell type, these are the genes that define it, you actually can't use any of the methods inside of either SURET or SCATER or um, SCRAN. There's only one method currently that actually calculates accurate p-values for comparisons between clusters, because the act of clustering our cells creates a bias. Right, so if we have this distribution of gene expression across our cells, when we cluster our data, we're using this gene expression to cluster them. So by definition, we'll cut this in half and assign cells with high expression of this gene to one cluster, and cells that have low expression of this gene to the other cluster even if, in truth, this gene is just evenly expressed across all of our clusters, and the differences are just due to noise. This means we'll get a bias in our p-values, and we'll actually get a ton of false positives if we don't correct for this. So this reference here has a statistical test that actually corrects for this appropriately and will give you accurate p-values. I'm not actually gonna cover how it does that because 99.9% .9 of the time, you don't care. You're not gonna bother with this because this is gonna take a long time to run and it's you're gonna have to do extra steps to set it up. Most of the time, you just care about getting the top genes. So instead you're gonna use something that's fast and easy to run. So you're probably going to use a fast non-parametric test. So non-parametric test means we don't make any assumption about what the distribution of values our data follows. So a t-test is a parametric test because it assumes your data is normally distributed. The Wilcox rank sum test is the equivalent of a t-test, but it does not assume a normal distribution. So non-parametric tests are independent of the distribution of data values. So if you've done like batch correction, normalization, scaling, calculated Pearson residuals, and you're not sure what distribution your data follows, you can still use a non-parametric test. 
So no matter what you've done to your data, you can still use a non-parametric test. But it also doesn't account for any confounding factors in the difference of expression, right? It's the equivalent of a t-test. It's just saying, is group A bigger than group B? So if you want to include batch effects or deal with batch effects or normalization, you have to do that before you apply this test. And they did a big comparison of different differential, differential expression methods for calculating marker genes a while ago. Lots of tests all basically work, including the Wilcoxon rank sum test. So because the Wilcoxon rank sum test is independent of the distribution and it's super fast to run, most packages will use the Wilcoxon rank sum test by default. So if you are running a function that's find marker genes, you're probably running the Wilcox rank sum test except for ScanPy I've now discovered. ScanPy doesn't do this. Even though their tutorial says to use the Wilcox rank sum test, it's not actually the default, so you have to specify it. All right, so that's finding marker genes. Now we want to do case control differential expression. So here I have the example where we've got a, not a, a bunch of samples from knockout mice, some of them have APOE4, some of them have APP knock-in, and we want to know the effect on microglia. So we did an experiment with a bunch of mice. We have 12 mice, three in each of our four groups, or wild type, one mutant, one of each mutant, or the double mutant. We do single cell RNA-seq, and we get a whole bunch of cells from each of these mice. Now we want to do our differential expression test. So for a differential expression test, we always want to compare our sets of replicates. But in this case, what is a replicate? Is it a mouse or is it a cell? Yeah, so it's a mouse is our biological replicate. So we don't want to look at each cell anymore. We want to look at each mouse. So we have an N of three per group, not an N of 3,000. So what we do is we use what's known as a pseudo-bulk approach. So here we're going to take our single cell RNA-seq and turn it back into bulk RNA-seq. Only now, because we've done single cell, we can do it on a cell type specific basis. So essentially, in silico, so in our computer, we're flow sorting all of our cells into different cell types, and then going to do bulk RNA seq. So here we aggregate the expression of all the cells of a particular cell type within each of our biological replicates, so within each of our mice. Then we choose a model or tool for bulk RNA seq differential expression and use it for our single cell. So uh, DSeq2 and EdgeR are sort of the most popular ones, and they're based on what's known as a general linear model, or GLM. So what's a GLM? So, so to understand what a GLM is, we're going to start, instead of going straight to this, with just linear regression. So hopefully everyone knows what linear regression is. Right? We have continuous value on the x-axis, so length of a Huntington gene, cognitive de decline on the y-axis, and we fit a line to it. If y equals mx plus b, we have a slope, we have an intercept, we understand this, this is easy. So I'm gonna introduce, we're gonna change that m and b into b0 and b1, just so we can add more. So we can have b2, b3, b4, et cetera, in the future. Okay, so here b with a number under it is a coefficient of our model. Right, the next step is, right now we've got continuous x and continuous y. What if x is discrete? Right? So in case of our little situation, gene expression is going to be our y value, but x is going to be mutant or not, or pathogenic or not. So how do we deal with that? Right? So now we've got, is pathogenic? No or yes. And we want to do 
linear regression on this. Linear regression requires numbers. So we're going to turn no into the number zero and yes into the number one. Now we've got numbers again. We can do linear regression. So there's our line, we fitted with linear regression. Our equation, B0 is now the mean expression in group zero, so not pathogenic. And B1 is the difference in expression between is pathogenic and is not pathogenic. Okay, everyone's following. Right, yeah, so B0 is average of group one, B1 is Group two, average of group two minus group one. So we can instead have APOE uh, knockout or wild type as our X value here and expression of our gene on the Y axis. So now we want to do two knockouts at the same time. So we have APOE, APOE knockout, zero or one, and APP knockout as zero or one. And again, our expression on the Y axis. So we can just expand this model. So now we have B0 plus B1 times X and plus B2 times Z. So X is APOE knockout or not. Z is APP knockout or not. So we can fit our regression model. And now this is a general linear model because we've got multiple predictors. So B1 is going to be the difference between APP, well, APP knockout versus wild type in both groups. So both FOE knockout and FOE wild, uh, wild type. B2 becomes the slope going the other way. So that's the slope with respect to FOE knockout or not in both of our groups for APP. So we can pull apart the effect of FOE knockout versus APP knockout. And B0 is now the expression when we have wild type APP and wild type FOE. But what if there's a synergistic effect and the group for where we have both knockouts is actually different than if we just added together the effects of each one? So then we just add a new B. That's going to be the difference between our expected value for both, both mutants together and our observed expression for both knockouts together. And that's called an interaction term. So we have B3 times X times Z. So because X and Z are zero or one, if X is one and Z is zero, this is zero, so there's no B3. If X is zero and Z is one, the whole thing is zero, so there's no B3. It's only if X is one and Z is one that B3 is added to our expression. So B3 is our interaction between FOE and APP. Okay, so now let's put this into practice. So we have our data for a particular gene. We calculate for all of our genes, the expression in each mouse. We have our model, that's going to be y equals b0 plus b1 plus b2 plus z. Yeah, and uh, that's what all these mean. x is APP, z is FOE, and those are each of the slopes. And then we ask simply whether each of these slopes are significantly different from zero or not. Yeah. Um, so it's maybe back a little bit. When you're doing pseudo bulk and this type of analysis, mm -hmm. do you usually still do all of the clustering and annotation uh, with the cells together? Or would you then separate them out and cluster them and annotate them separately? So you can do it either way. All you need to have is a label for the cell type that is the same across all of your samples. So a T cell has to be a T cell has to be a T cell in each of your samples. And then you just aggregate the expression of T cells in each of your samples. And then you pull out just those values and run a jar or DSeq2 on them. So even if you 
might have had a slightly different definition of T cells had you done it a different way. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. As long as it just matters that the label is the same. So if you have T cell in one data set and CD4 positive T cell in a different data set, well, you have to figure out for yourself that those are the same and you want to compare those groups to each other. You just need consistent cell type names across your data. Okay. Any questions about differential expression? Yeah? Um, how do you convert, like, the, let's say the Surat object is like the D sec 2 object? Or like... So, how do you convert them? So, we will do this in the lab in a little bit. Um, you can use something called average expression in Surat to calculate the pseudo bulks, or you can do it yourself. Um, we'll provide you a function to do it that you're welcome to use after the course as, as well. Um, but yeah, you, you'll just essentially calculate those averages from your Surat object, turn it into an ordinary matrix, and then turn that ordinary matrix into a DSeq2 object. There's no automatic conversion. Any other questions? No? All right. So talk a little bit about break gene regulatory networks. Someone asked about that. Essentially, the only method that works well is called scenic. And it only works well because it combines a ton of prior information. So essentially what it does is it calculates the average expression, uh, the gene gene correlations between all your pairs of genes across your cells, identifies the transcription factors that are associated with each cluster of co-expressed genes in across your cells, looks for, find, figures out from an external database the motif that matches those transcription factors, and then looks to see whether there's a difference in the, the presence of that binding site at the uh, TSS of a gene is related to the expression of that gene. So do all the genes with the transcription factor binding site be correlated with each other? Builds up this matrix of which genes are assigned to which regulon and which transcription factor. Doubles checks for enrichment of motifs or peaks in ATAC-seq and builds up your TSNE or clusters based on these identified brachulons, as it calls them. So this mainly only works for mouse or human data because you need these external motifs, motif information, but it works reasonably well. And then once you've done your differential expression or identified Identifying your regulons, you'll want to do pathway analysis. So most people just use standard uh, pathway analysis tools. So there's G-Profiler or GSEA or Gorilla or whatever you want. Uh, I'm only showing this because I got fed up of using those and having 20 different plots, each for my 20 different cell types. Uh, so I've written a little package that can aggregate together your pathway analysis results across 20 different cell types into one heat map. Um, so this is not yet published. I'm writing the paper this summer, uh, but you're welcome to use it if you would find it helpful. Uh, it also has a method that I'm showing here that will condense pathways that have the same genes contributing to them. So you can see this group here are all ribosome related pathways and they get compressed down to one pathway on the right-hand side. Uh, where is that? Ribosome assembly, there it is in the middle there. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry people on that side, I don't think I can point it out. It's like, it's like there, ribosome assembly. Uh, so it means if you're looking at the top 10 pathways in each cell type, now at least you, those are 10 different pathways instead of 10 pathways that are all the same. But otherwise, yeah, you just do it the same way as any other data set. All right, 
So here's an example of a complex data set. Design how you would analyze this. Give you some time to think about that and feel free to discuss with your neighbors. Uh, there are multiple different ways to do it. Okay, hopefully everyone's had a chance to think about this. So I always find it easiest to draw this out, what my data looks like. So I have three donors that are diabetic, three donors that are healthy, I have three replicates. There's no overlap between them, my different replicates. So the sort of most obvious thing to do would be take all of these samples, integrate them together, without correcting for batch effects, cluster the integrated data, label, annotate them, then create pseudovolts by summing the raw counts for, each, for cells from the, each donor in each cluster, and doing DC2 to find the differential expressed genes in each cluster between diabetic and healthy 
Another way you could do it is to get a cluster each sample se separately. Match the clusters across donors by looking at the correlation and the average expression of each cluster to the other clusters. Then you can use uh, a fancier model called a GLMM that can account for the fact that we have different donors rather than doing the pseudo bulk method and then do the differential expression with that. So uh, that method is called Nebula, if you want to try it out. Um, it's mostly useful if you want to do pseudo time in between uh, two different conditions, because obviously you can't aggregate a pseudo bulk expression in pseudo time. You don't have a bunch of cells at the same point in your pseudo time, that doesn't really work. Uh, but using a general linear mixed model, you can have your effect of donor in the model, your effect of pseudo time in the model, and then your condition as well in the model. And then you can do differential expression between conditions through pseudo time, accounting for the fact that you'll actually only have six donors and not 60,000 biological replicates. All right, summarize. Single cell RNA seq uses graph based clustering because it's fast. Choosing the appropriate clustering resolution is hard, and there might be many right answers. Clustering and annotation are tightly linked and often go back and forth between each other. So you might cluster at a particular resolution, try and annotate it, realize you're missing some cell types, go back to clustering, change the resolution, see if you've now found those cell types. Or maybe you'll cluster your, your data, go to annotation, realize you've got five different clusters that you can't tell the difference between them when you try and annotate them. So maybe you go back to clustering and reduce the resolution. Automatic annotation is fast, but it's only reliable for very distinct cell types. Uh, cell states, it's not very good for. If you wanna look at manual annotation, if you wanna look at subtypes or novel cell types, you gotta do manual annotation. Looking at marker genes in the liter literature. And to accurately represent biological rep replicates, when you're doing differential expression, you can use pseudobulks or you can use uh, general linear mixed models.